It is now my pleasure to introduce our main speaker to the stage. Kate Scalisi is a sexual health educator, writer, and consultant. She's spoken at Yale School of Public Health, John Hopkins Medical University, Northwestern University, and Emory University. She has a degree in neuroscience from Stonehill College and a master's of public health focused on sexual education from Johns Hopkins University. I also have it on good authority that she's done it a time or two. Please welcome Kate to the stage. Hoo-ha, cookie, cupcake, down there, tingly bits, below the belt, or nothing. These are all just a few of the euphemisms that we have all heard when it comes to talking about the triangle between our legs that is our genitals. Most of these are very related to the vulva, but again, we've heard them all. Many of us have probably also said them. I know I do still to get through spam filters and to get into mainstream media. It's the only way. It's the only way. We've probably laughed at one of them. Maybe it made us uncomfortable, or maybe it was just like, oh, that one's silly. I never thought of that before. And then some of us maybe have always felt a visceral discomfort that we talk about our genitals differently than we talk about any other body part. We've always kind of intuited that it's, it's not just harmless or silly, and it's probably not protecting anyone, which is the argument that often gets made, right? Like, if we don't tell them what it is, they won't touch it, they won't explore it, it'll just be hidden, it'll be nothing. Okay. And to those of you who've ever felt that, you are right, and I'm going to show you how and why today. So as I was, my lovely MC has introduced me, I'm Kate and I'm a sex educator, and my goal in life and my mission in this world is to create freedom and pleasure for each and every person in this room and beyond. And when I talk about freedom and pleasure, yes, I mean the freedom to experience pleasure, because it's often seen as frivolous, not necessary, right? but also freedom from concerns and shame and embarrassment and fear and all of those things about our bodies, our genitals, our desires, our wants, our longings, everything and anything holding us back from having intimate, exciting, and fulfilling sex, whatever that looks like individually to each and every person. Are we all on board with that? Is that something we all want? Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. And so one of the pieces of that, there are many bedrocks of this. It is not all or nothing. There's no magic key, no matter what Cosmo and every other magazine out there tries to tell us. But one of the bedrocks of that is not being so afraid to even name, again, that triangle between our legs down there. It's being able to speak those words. And so I'm going to talk us through a couple of myths that are rooted in this silence around genitals and talk about why it actually is harming us from consent to pleasure to shame. It's not helping us in any way. Excuse me. So myth number one, who here has ever thought that vulvas are more complicated than penises? Raise your hand if you've ever had that thought and don't leave me standing up here on my own because <laughs> I know at least some of you are lying. Okay, so uh, recently a person on Instagram has had a claim to fame because of penis latte art that he is making, which please send it my way. Um, and in the interview, when this person was asked, well, do you ever do vulvas? The response was, well, they're just more complicated. So not really. Every now and then, but not really. This made my blood boil. I was so angry because A, a well-drawn penis has just as much detail and intricacy as a well-drawn vulva, okay? Right, like they're both amazing and intricate and detailed. But also because what does that say to people who have vulvas? It says you are complicated. Your pleasure is complicated. And I don't have to figure it out. And if it works for me, then that's fine. It works for you too. And like, I don't have to spend the time figuring out what it is. It impacts our pleasure. It impacts being able to say yes and no because they go hand in hand, right? So that's myth number one. And really, they are all the same parts organized differently. Let me make sure this slide comes up. This is a slightly graphic slide. I apologize. I made sure that it is not too graphic. But what I want to point out on this one here, let me see if, there you go. You can see as we go down that they're really the same until the very end. The genitals look the same when they're developing in utero. And then if we shift to this one over here, this, ooh, there you go. This is the clitoris. That one's the penis. Some people say the penis is a big clitoris. Some people say the clitoris is a little penis. You get to choose however you wanna. You wanna talk about that? I got yelled at when I said it was a little penis. I got very quickly corrected. So <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, I'm saying corrected. But the point is, Emily Nagoski in her book, Come As You Are, it's amazing. One of her central tenets is all the same parts organized differently. 
And if these two images don't prove that, I don't know what else does. And it's not just the genital parts. It's our brains and how we're wired. It's how we experience pleasure and pain and sensation. All the same parts organized differently. They are not that different, even if they look it, right? And of course, I want to acknowledge and recognize that it is not a binary. Genitals come on a spectrum just like everything else in this wonderful world. Okay, that's myth number one. Myth number two is that your genitals are always right. So there have been some studies looking at, you know, what turns people on? How do we figure this out? And so what they do is they bring people into a lab and they hook up their tingly bits, whatever tingly bits they have, to different monitors. So for penises, they put a little strap around it to measure how hard it gets. And for vaginas, they measure how wet it gets to see what turns you on. And then they show them porn, which like, sign me up, please. Like, love to please take me to your lab to do this and they measure they see how hard the people with penises get and how wet the people with vulvas get and then they also ask them to say you know hey how are you feeling do you feel turned on is this making you feel like a little sexy and fun right and what we find is this for people with penises when they get turned on when their penises get hard it matches and aligns with the sexuality that they say they are so for people who are heterosexual, they only get turned on when they watch the heterosexual porn and vice versa, okay? And then when you look at the objective versus subjective arousal, so if the penis gets hard versus what they're thinking, you see that about 50% of the time it matches up. So their penis is hard and they say, yeah, I feel aroused. Mm -hmm. Those match, it's concordance, okay? So that's people with penises. Then we look at people with vulvas. And what we see is that their vulvas get wet for basically anything and every type of porn they watch. <laughs> right? So regardless of their sexuality, and even in fact when they watch animals having sex, their vulvas are still getting wet. Okay? Okay. And then when you look at their subjective arousal, their what are they thinking and feeling, these only align, guess how much? Give me a number. Who said, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, y'all yeah, read the book, didn't you? <laughs> Some of you read the study. Okay, 10% is it. So only 10% of the time is this concordance, this matching up of what the genitals are doing and what the brain is thinking, okay? Why does this matter? This matters because when we hear about sexual assault and there's this argument, well, the person got off, they were wet, that discounts it, right? But in fact, what we know is that the genitals only tell us like, oh, hey, that's sexy. So the animals having sex wasn't being like, oh, I'm turned on by this. It was like, oh, this is, this is sexual stimuli. This is saying, okay, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. Just like when we get cold, we get goosebumps, right? Or we shiver, right? It's just a stimuli. Versus our brain always tells us. And so one thing that I hear a lot is this idea of, you know, my partner gets turned on so easily and I don't, and what's up with that? And this is where this concordance comes in versus non-concordance. And we also see that for people with vulvas, because it is not as common, it is viewed as not being normal. And in fact, it really is. Okay. So that's myth number two. Myth number three is that desire and the desire to have sex just happens like that. So specific example of this is, and this is going to be a very heteronormative example from someone I've worked with, so please excuse that for the moment, is my husband, like I'll be bending over to like pick something up kids toys, clothes off the floor, something like that, and my husband will be instantly hard and turned on. And like, I don't understand because I was literally cleaning, like I don't get it, what happened? So this is not sexy, I don't feel sexy, I'm like in PJs, right? So I hear this a lot. And this is called spontaneous desire, very original name, pretty self-explanatory. And it's when it feels like the desire just happens and the penis is, because of the concordance, the penis is most likely to match up, right? They see it, they're turned on, they think it. Okay, so that's spontaneous. People with vulvas, what I often hear is some version of this. The sex is great when we have it, but I never want to have it. And I just, I want to want it, but I never want it. But it's really good. Like, their sex life is great when it actually happens. And this is something called responsive desire. Again, self-explanatory name. Okay. And so with responsive desire, it is this idea that you only get turned on, you only have this concordance start to happen when after sexy things start to happen. So after the stimuli, after the kissing and the massaging and the touching and whatever sexy thing is to you and each person. And so here again we see these aren't matching up. And so how did we get here? Two ends, masculinity and morality. So masculinity, this idea that what happens to people who identify as male, generally cis, 
hetero, white, affluent males, right? That's who a lot of the studies are done on. What they have is normal, and this isn't just with sex. I feel like I'm preaching a little bit here that this is a group that I don't have to go into this too much. But this isn't just with sex. We see this in so many aspects of our lives. And so with sex, that's the same. And if you don't match up to that, if your genitals are different, if your genitals and your gender don't match, if your desire comes later, then you're seen as broken and not normal. And it's just not true. Because when it comes to sex, what I've learned, I've been doing this for over seven years now, and what I've learned is that there is no normal. There's more and less common, and that's it. Okay? And it's all beautiful and wonderful, and then ultimately normal. Okay? So that's masculinity. Morality. The way I like to sum up this without doing a whole nother talk on it <laughs> is the nerve that runs to the genitals, to the penis, to the vulva, to the scrotum, and to the anus is the pudendal nerve. Does anyone know the Latin word that pudendal comes from and what it means? I think I heard, I think I heard a little bit whispered, I'm not sure. So it comes from the Latin for to be ashamed. Okay. So the very nerve that brings us pleasure in our genitals, exactly that, that reaction. <laughs> the first time I heard it, I was like, no. So it is, this shame is so insidious that even the nerves that we have are named after it and for it. So there are so many layers of shedding that need to happen beyond just the not naming, because even when we named it originally, whoever did, they went with the shame response. But it is not all doom and gloom. There is good news. The good news is that we are seeing a shift slowly but surely. We are seeing people step up and say, I deserve pleasure. Consent is not a question. It is, needs to be the mandated. It needs to be what's normal. And we are seeing movements like body positivity and fat positivity and free the nipple. And two of New York City, which is where I'm from, two of our most popular subway stations earlier this year, Union Square and Times Square, got taken over with these ads like this from Thinks. Thinks are period panties, okay? This would not have happened even two years ago. And I mean, this is pretty, <laughs> they are not trying to be subtle here. And in the subway cars, there are these, which made people uncomfortable because of course I was listening to what everyone was saying as they walked into the subway cars. And I was like, oh yeah, everyone's gonna be uncomfortable. Tell me more, right? So we're seeing this change. We're seeing people stepping up and starting to shed this shame. And so why does this matter? Consent and pleasure are the two most important reasons. So rather than kind of dig into each, here's what happens when we start by naming and owning our genitals. Whatever name you want to use is okay, by the way. Doesn't matter. Coochie, cupcake, whatever. Choose from what you want. So, <laughs> Bob Dylan. Amen. There you go. Now you know, call this one Bob Dylan from now on. <laughs> Not Josh, Bob Dylan. Okay. So what starts to happen is one, you realize you aren't alone. You realize, oh, hey, your inner lips are longer than your outer lips. Me too. Oh, I'm not alone. And sometimes that shared reality for some people is all they need, right? And for others, it's a small first step. But when you start to name and you start to own these things, we start to shed that shame and you realize you are not alone. And whether we're talking about sex, body differences, even chronic illness, knowing you're not alone is really, really friggin' powerful, right? So then once we have that. Then you can start to examine the thoughts and the ideas and the stereotypes and you start to question them because now you know you're not alone. You're not weird or abnormal because other people are like you and there is no normal, right? I'm just going to keep saying that over and over again. But once you do that, you start to be able to question and so these ideas lose their power. This idea that vulvas are more complicated than penises loses its power idea that you know desire needs to just happen and that what your genitals say is always right they start to lose their power and you get to question and then the third thing that happens which is my favorite and most exciting part personally is that you get to start exploring now you get to say well these things that I thought were true may not be true so let me figure out what's true for me and you get to play and you get to explore and you get to find out both your yeses and your noes and so I know we're, we're in California, land of yes means yes, right? It's the law. And often yes means yes and no means no are pitted against each other. But in reality, they're all the same. Because how can you know what to say yes to or no to if you don't know the opposite as well? You need, we need both. You can't say no without knowing your yeses. And so when we get rid of the shame and we take these steps and we name them and we start to unravel them and question, they lose their power and we get to figure out this is my yes, this is my no. Okay. And so this is what this is all about. It's about letting go of shame, having more consent, having sexier, more fun and positive consent, which is always a good thing for everyone because consent is not always easy or fun for people. And then ultimately, of course, it always comes back to ultimately finding freedom and pleasure.
Thank you.